So welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show that showed the profiles of humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring future and future creators, and all those like really great stories. I'm Ira Pastor, your uh, your exponential health ambassador along for this journey. So you know, a few episodes ago, we began to segue into a fascinating area of biology that has really broad potential applications across various domains of both human health and enhancement. And that was this general theme of, of organism dormancy. Uh, we got our feet wet uh, talking about the topic of torpor, uh, sort of the state of decreased physiological activity in animals with reduced body temperatures and metabolic rates, which enables them to survive for long periods of time with the reduced food availability. And we talked a little bit about the, the Arctic ground squirrel uh, up in Alaska. Today's show, uh, we are going to go a few levels of extreme further uh, as we touch on the topic of cryptobiosis, uh, which is broadly defined as a, an extreme metabolic state of life that's entered by organisms in response to rather extreme uh, adverse environmental conditions, whether that be uh, drying out or desiccation, freezing, oxygen deficiency, and so forth. Uh, in the state of cryptobiosis, uh, pretty much all measurable metabolic activities stop uh, preventing reproduction, development, repair, uh, and then ultimately these creatures can rebound uh, when uh, times are more hospitable. Uh, and, and I don't think one could argue that the, the, the true king of the hill uh, on this planet when it comes to these skills uh, are our friends the tardigrades, uh, colloquially known as the, uh, the water bears or moss piglets, uh, which is this fine of uh, water dwelling uh, eight-legged segmented micro animals. Uh, these organisms are found everywhere from mountaintops to deep sea, volcanoes, tropical rainforests, Antarctica, uh, and they are among the most resilient organisms known with uh, species capable of surviving both extremes of hot and cold, uh, oxygen deprivation, radiation, dehydration, uh, starvation, and, and, and the vacuum of space. Uh, today we are joined by a guest that with, without a doubt knows the, the species the best uh, of anyone on the planet, and that is Dr. Thomas Boothby. Uh, Dr. Boothby is assistant professor of the Department of Molecular Biology at the University of Wyoming, uh, and his core area of studies are the molecular mechanisms of extreme stress tolerance as he defines biology at the very limits of life. Uh, Dr. Boothby got his PhD at the University of Maryland in cell molecular biology, where he spent time studying the mechanisms of recovery, gene expression, and morphogenesis. Uh, in various uh, extremophilic organisms. Uh, and he spent the last several years at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill doing postdoc work uh, studying both biochemistry and the mechanisms of these extremotolerant organisms. Uh, all that being said, uh, Dr. Boothby, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we typically start the show off by giving our guests the floor a bit just to talk a little bit about themselves, sort of you, your background, sort of how you got interested in science and molecular biology and ultimately what led you to this as you define sort of the science and life on the very edge sure sure yeah so um geez kind of to go way back i guess sort of my interest in biology started as a as a kid um my my parents worked for the united nations so we grew up moving kind of all around the world um and spent a large portion of my childhood growing up uh in east africa Mm. in Mozambique and Kenya. So as a kid that loved to be outside, those experiences were uh, really special, you know, getting to getting to go and, you know, drive around in the middle of the savanna and camp out and just see, you know, every animal that you can imagine um, really sort of stoked uh, a love for, for nature in me. Um, <clears throat> And just always liked biology, ecology, took those courses um, in high school and college, and then in college decided that biology was the way that I'd like to go. Mm -hmm. um, so completed that coursework, started a PhD program at the University of Maryland. Um, and there, I actually started off not particularly studying stress tolerance per se, but using a stress tolerant organism because it had some other interesting features to, um, <clears throat> to, to, to study. Um, and essentially that, that system that I was looking at was a fern spore and as part of that fern spore's natural life cycle, it required being desiccated. So it required losing essentially all the water inside of 
the, the single cell housed within the spore coat. And in that dry state, those spores can persist for decades. Mm. You throw them back in water, and within a few hours, they've gone through this massive developmental program um, that will ultimately give rise to a plant. Um, so I always thought that that was a really sort of fascinating question. Like, we sort of take the adage, life is water, uh, maybe for granted, right? Sure, like, sure. all metabolism requires an aqueous uh, environment to take place in. You know, we can go for maybe like about 100 hours without water. Mm -hmm. If we lose 30% of our intracellular water content, we're dead. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, there are organisms out there that can lose essentially all the water inside their cells or even bodies for more complex uh, animals, um, and yet somehow survive that. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of how uh, really fascinated me. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to pursue as a postdoc, um, that was one of the questions that really jumped out to the forefront as sort of like a really interesting thing to study in biology. Just a cool thing that occurs in nature that we don't know that much about. Um, and it wasn't until I really started and got into doing the research in my postdoc that I seriously considered any of the sort of societal uh, benefits or mm -hmm. potential sort of real world applications um, for, for this fundamental biology that we're doing, looking at how organisms survive extreme stresses and in extreme environments. Um, but yeah, luckily at the University of North Carolina, um, I had the pleasure to work with two really great mentors who both let me sort of explore both the fundamental side of the research I was interested in and also um, were very supportive about the sort of uh, application-based side of things. Um, that I started to expand out to at UNC, and now at Wyoming, um, that makes up probably, you know, half of the lab uh, is working on applied aspects of this research. Outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah, it, 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 I, I, I appreciate the passion in your, in your voice when you talk about sort of these, uh, these outliers in nature, and, you know, yeah. they're here, um, they exist, and, you know, they're <laughs> you know, why <laughs> and uh, yeah. and what can we learn from them and um, I call them the sort of the superheroes whether it's you know the tardigrades or regenerating species or or sure. any of you know uh, these folks but they're yeah it's it's really outstanding and uh, yeah and think, domain of biology you know, another thing that sort of gets overlooked sometimes is the fact that you know as scientists we typically consider ourselves to be like pretty pretty smart intelligent creative people so when we want to when we want to solve a problem, we think, you know, we just have to sit down with a, a pencil and a pad of paper and we can like reason through this and logic it out. I think sometimes, you know, you can learn a lot of good lessons just by looking at nature. Nature's had to solve so many problems. Life has had billions of years of trial and error to figure out ways to deal with problems. Um, there's a bit of hubris involved in thinking that we can just sort of sit down with a, with a piece of paper and do a better job than nature. So Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I kind of take the, the path of least resistance and just look for good examples of how a problem that I'm interested in solving has been solved, has been solved before. And I think nature is one of the best places to look for that sort of, that sort of inspiration. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Completely agree. Um, so, you know, one of the areas that um, you have, you've written quite a bit about uh, recently is, is this principle, uh, you know, as you're looking for mechanisms and reasons why, um, you, you've written a bit about this, this principle of the intrinsically disordered protein, sort of, sort of generally defined as this uh, sort of unique, well, actually, it goes sort of against the typical thinking of, you know, all proteins are defined by sort of this three-dimensional structure, but here you have these unique proteins that lack um, structure uh and um you you know you're connecting a lot of this to you know what goes on at at these extremes that allow uh species like tardigrades to bounce back and, and do what they do could you talk a little, a little bit more about this topic and then sort of how it relates to uh robustness in, in in these species sure so um before i begin actually speaking about disordered proteins mm -hmm. uh just as a little bit of background. Um, for, for a long time, 
uh, sort of the poster child for desiccation and other stress tolerances was this molecule called trailose, which okay. is a, a disaccharide sugar. Uh, so basically a sugar made up of two glucose molecules stuck together. And uh, this sugar was seen in many uh, stress tolerant organisms, particularly organisms that can survive desiccation mm -hmm. to accumulate at really high levels. Um, and so there's this connection between drying out and surviving and having lots of this sugar. Then subsequently, people did a lot of functional experiments to show that those organisms need that sugar and that if you take that sugar and put it into other systems, in some cases, you can actually make those systems more stress tolerant, so able to, to withstand desiccation. So for a long time, folks thought that, that the sugar trellis was just kind of like the, the magic bullet, like that's just how nature figured out how to survive desiccation. Um, now, uh, one, one problem uh, with that theory uh, cropped up when it was reported that these little organisms called rotifers, mm -hmm. uh, which are the, just kind of these tiny little aquatic animals that can survive uh, desiccation, freezing, high levels of radiation, all these sort of extreme stresses. Um, it was found that they actually do not make or accumulate trailos to large levels. Mm. So sort of this this like magic bullet of desiccation tolerance sort of came into question. And I don't want to uh, imply that trailos is not important in many systems. It's just that it appears that nature has found other ways besides using the sugar trailos to survive desiccation. So we actually very early on uh, when we started working with tardigrades um, noticed that, that the species we were working with uh, they lacked the genes required to make the sugar trailose. Okay. So like rotifers, there were some hints that they maybe didn't use the sort of classic stress tolerance molecule for surviving desiccation. So the question sort of became, well, if there are some organisms that can survive drying out, but they don't have the sugar trailose, what might they have instead? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, what, what might they have, have evolved to basically do the job of trailos? And this is when we, we sort of stumbled upon these intrinsically disordered proteins in tardigrades. And actually, if you look across many desiccation tolerant organisms, I can't actually think of one where we don't see a large accumulation of disordered proteins during desiccation. So. I'm sure there are exceptions to this rule, just as there were uh, for, for trellos, but it seems like a hallmark of desiccation tolerance is the accumulation of large amounts of, of disordered proteins. Okay. And just to take a step back, I mean, you sort of already mentioned, but intrinsically disordered proteins are kind of these enigmatic uh, proteins in the sense that sort of the, the dogma of protein biochemistry for decades has been that the structure of a protein dictates its function. Mm -hmm. So the shape a protein adopts uh, basically allows it to do a job. And if you break or denature or unfold that protein so that it no longer is in that shape it's normally in, it doesn't work properly. Now, disordered proteins are enigmatic because they basically take this structure to function paradigm and turn it on its head where intrinsically disordered proteins or IDPs are proteins that in solution sort of constantly change shape. Um, so they're able to adopt uh, sort of myriad conformations. Mm. Now, when I say that they're constantly changing shape, uh, you know, we don't need to go into this in detail, but it's important to, to understand that that doesn't necessarily mean the shapes they adopt are random. Mm. So different disordered proteins sort of occupy different shape space where they can exist in different conformations but within a certain set of parameters so they can't they can't be any shape or they won't adopt any shape right. um, but that that sort of varies between different disordered proteins now we did a lot of work um, and we can we can go into more details about about how we did this work and what we did uh, if you'd like but um, kind of to make a long story short what we found about these disordered proteins in tardigrades 
And now we're going on to look at disordered proteins in other stress tolerant organisms to see if they do the same thing. Is that basically when they dry out, instead of forming crystals, so these are solids that have okay. really rigid molecular structures, instead of forming crystals, they form what we call amorphous or glass like solids. Hmm. So these are solids that do not have a crystal that don't have crystallinity they don't have a rigid molecular structure the molecular structure of these solids is much more amorphous and kind of random mm. now this is important for two reasons um, the first is that having crystals in your cells is really bad so tardigrades make a lot of these disordered proteins when they're drying out if the if they all turned into big crystals Basically, the cell would be full, a tardigrade cell would be full of really sharp, pointy things that mm. could, you know, puncture membranes, crush other proteins, shred up DNA, just generally do a lot of bad stuff inside Absolutely. of the cell. So not forming crystalline solids is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that, forming these glass-like solids, these more amorphous solids, actually allows these disordered proteins to basically adapt to intracellular things. So mm -hmm. if there's like other sensitive proteins or DNA or membranes, they can basically form around mm -hmm. those uh, components. And in the process of doing so, what we think is happening is that they actually make the cytosol, the inside of the cell, so okay. viscous, sort of so thick. Like okay. you can think about the difference between like, water and honey, but mm. this is like super concentrated honey that's extremely viscous. And the consequence of doing that is that when a sensitive protein might be unfolding and, and breaking, it's actually the time that's needed for that unfolding to occur in this viscous environment is extended out to such a degree that the protein essentially on a biological time scale just never unfolds. Mm. So we may slow down all the detrimental processes to the point where they essentially just don't happen in a time scale that we're interested in. And then when you add water back to the system, all these uh, disordered proteins that are making up this super viscous matrix, um, they essentially just dissolve back into uh, the, the liquid, the water that you've added back. They resolvate and they release all those important sensitive biomolecules that they had sort of encapsulated inside this really viscous uh, matrix that they mm -hmm. make. Completely, completely fascinating. I mean, as, as you're going through this, it's you're, you sort of sound like any science fiction movie I ever watched where you find the right. weird alien and it has these, <laughs> these really unique abilities, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's completely amazing. Um, and, um, Fascinating to listen to you talk about it. But, you know, along, you know, speaking about sort of now the, the preservation and the sort of the slowing of life, um, I had the, uh, the opportunity about, I don't know what it was, maybe about a year, a year and a half ago in, in listening in to this, uh, this DARPA uh, biostasis conference call uh, in front of our U.S., uh, Ex-US uh, listeners or, or, or viewers, the DARPA is the uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. It's part of the uh, the, the DoD here, um, and you know the, the topic of this talk uh, was that of the so-called golden hour, where uh, under catastrophic uh, situations, whether we're talking about a you know, battlefield or an earthquake or something horrible that happens, you have this window of time where life can be preserved and one of the, the main concepts is you know how can we slow things down a la tardigrade knowledge in the sense to very slow levels so we can get somebody on a helicopter elsewhere or an airplane or whatever um obviously you know you don't want to do anything confidential because you know i know a lot of you know, your research is, is is being leveraged in these areas can you talk about some of the uh, just sort of the, the translational ideas that that you are thinking of and others may be thinking of in this space, whether, um, you know, we're talking about small molecules to uh, stimulate this or, uh, or gene, gene therapies to create intrinsically disordered proteins in humans. What are some of the sort of the ideas that are being bantered around in terms of uh, how one can use tardigrade style knowledge for preserving this golden hour period? Sure, sure. So 
um, you know, w what we think uh, is, is really interesting about this research is the potential for it to sort of translate to societal benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, you know, I'm interested in thinking about how we can apply this to um, both global health and also mm -hmm. to sort of uh, adverse or crisis uh, situations. So, you know, at a, at a basic level, um, there's some things that we can, you know, just very simply uh, look at um, that I think could have a lot of, a lot of uh, benefit to, to global health. Um, and so, you know, sort of what we're working on the lab now in that regard is the stabilization of vaccines and other protein-based pharmaceuticals Excellent. in a dry state. So the issue with a lot of these, these pharmaceuticals that are protein-based is that they require what's called the cold chain to mm -hmm. maintain their viability. And what the cold chain is, is basically a series of interconnected refrigerators and freezers that keep these medicines cold all the time. Mm -hmm. If the medicines heat up, like so for a typical vaccine, um, you need to keep it between two and eight degrees Celsius or it'll go bad uh, very quickly. Um, now, here in the United States and in, in other developed parts of the world, we may take the cold chain for granted, right? We may just sure. sort of assume like hospitals have refrigerators, like this isn't a problem. But in remote or developing parts of the world, this can be a huge economic and logistical burden. Um, so, for example, it's been, it's been estimated that up to about 90% of the cost of a vaccination program in a developing country comes just from the mere fact that you need to keep that vaccine cold. So having the electrical infrastructure in place that's actually stable, that you know the electricity is not gonna go off, um, then having the, the refrigerators and freezers, shipping vaccines with, with cold packs or, or in, uh, uh, using using refrigerators, um, all this adds up. And if there's a breakdown at any step in that cold chain, all the costs that went into maintaining that cold chain and all the costs of purchasing the vaccines and shipping them is it's all lost, right? Mm -hmm. The vaccine goes bad. So what we're looking at is basically we're looking at the tricks that tardigrades use to stabilize their desiccation sensitive proteins okay. using these intrinsically disordered proteins. And we think that that will translate well to vaccines. Vaccines are just proteins. Sure. And um, there's many other protein based pharmaceuticals that this type of research could be applied to. Um, but essentially, we're taking the tricks tardigrades use to stabilize their sensitive proteins and applying those to medically relevant proteins like vaccines and, 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 and protein-based pharmaceuticals. Um, and, you know, in lab, we have, we've done quite a bit of work looking at how these tardigrade proteins can stabilize other proteins, including proteins outside of tardigrades, right? So we can take proteins from other animals that normally when you dry them out, you completely destroy the function of that protein. We can mix them with our tardigrade proteins and we can get back 100% viability uh, for, for these, uh, these test proteins. Um, and the really exciting thing is that when we sort of compare the efficiency at which these tardigrade proteins protect, mm -hmm. um, they do so, uh, you know, in some cases, orders of magnitude better than FDA-approved protectants. So protectants that are out there that are used now to stabilize pharmaceuticals, uh, the tardigrade proteins can do just as good a job, if not better, and, and much more efficiently. So you need much more, you need much less of the tardigrade protein to mm. achieve 100% protection. Mm. Um, and so in this way, we're hoping that, you know, we'll be able to develop technology that will allow us to essentially stabilize a vaccine or other pharmaceutical in a dry state you don't need any refrigerators, no specialized equipment. You basically just have this thing in an envelope, the, the, the powdered vaccine in an envelope that you could just ship to whatever sort of local clinic uh, it needs to get to. And it can sit there on the shelf at room temperature 
or even at elevated temperatures uh, and remain viable for years. Then when you need the vaccine, you just reconstitute it in water or buffer and, uh, and go from there. Um, and then, so that, I mean, that, that sort of techno technology is something that we essentially have working in the lab already. Of course, we haven't gone through all the FDA trials and stuff, but moving forward from there, we're looking at how we can apply the same sort of strategies to more complex biological systems. So this would be instead of just taking, you know, essentially a purified protein, we would then be looking at uh, cells, um, looking at multicellular uh, complex sort of tissues, um, even organs perhaps, mm -hmm. and then even whole organisms. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of organisms, especially in the field of biology that we study, that we have to sort of continually propagate. There's no way to store them long term. So if you want to keep them, you have to you have to keep them alive and keep them having offspring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're looking at ways that basically with all these different, you know, genetic lines and, and things that, that researchers are generating, how we could apply tricks from tardigrades to basically stabilizing and preserving all these sort of uh, different genetic strains that are being generated um, in research labs for, for different organisms. Outstanding. I mean, the, the scope is amazing when you just think of, you know, vaccines, protein therapeutics, cell therapy products, gene therapy products, or I mean, I mean it's, it's amazing. <laughs> when you think about everything, you could pretty desiccate and just bring it back and dump it. Right. at some point. It's, uh, it, it, it's truly a fascinating scope uh, of possibilities. Um, uh, amazing. Um, you know, we, we touch on, you know, a lot of cutting edge science on this show. We also occasionally journey into the bleeding edge. And I just, you know, I, I have my, my boss, you know, obviously wants me to ask you the questions about some of the more science fiction topics, uh, if you would indulge us for a few minutes. Uh, clearly well, one of the things, whenever you, you read an article about um, the tardigrades in the press, they always mention, hey, we put them outside of the space station and they did just fine. <laughs> um, right. Can you talk a little, and then when you mention glassification or vit you know vitrification uh, once again it makes you think of you know what the cryonics people like to talk about and vitrifying sure. bodies um take us just if you would on a few minute you know futuristic journey uh, in, in some of these uh, whether we're talking about uh, deep space journeys or you know sure. reanimating whole human organisms at some point i mean i'm sure this isn't what you're working on today but you're sure right. you sit, sit in your bed at night and think about some of this stuff take us yeah. a little bit on this journey if you would well yeah i mean i think uh it's it's hard to do uh work in in this realm without sort of daydreaming about these hmm. uh sort of far out um science fiction at this point um type things and yeah i mean um I think the, 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 the idea of applying this to humans, applying this technology to humans is obviously something that people <clears throat> have thought about. Mm -hmm. I think the preservation of individual molecules or even individual cells um, is honestly a much different problem than the preservation of a large complex organism like a okay. human, um, especially from a technical standpoint. You can think how you might be able to encapsulate a protein in something that will dry out quickly and, and preserve it. You know, you can sort of preserve the whole protein because it's so small very rapidly, but how you would do that to a human mm -hmm. where you, you could essentially preserve our whole sort of biological structure instantaneously um, becomes problematic. And I think, you know, one of the issues would be, you know, if we tried to, if, if somebody tried to vitrify a human or something, a large animal or organism, the problem is you'd start to get vitrification in some tissues before others, okay. right? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be instantaneous. And the mechanical stresses that would be imparted on a biological system that had sort of this interface between being vitrified and dried and still being, uh, you know, a wet uh, tissue. Mm -hmm. um, 
that that would impose a number of mechanical stresses, not not to mention, you know, sort of subcellular biochemical physiological stresses, mm -hmm. but you'd probably just start ripping tissues apart gotcha. um, if you did that mechanically. So um, I like I, I love thinking about these sorts of things. Um, I think it's interesting it bring you know it's an interesting problem from a from a technology standpoint. I think it also brings up you know some interesting moral and philosophical uh, um, uh, aspects of of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that from a from a technical standpoint, we're pretty far away from uh, <laughs> no from doubt. anything like like vitrifying a human and sending them to Mars. Um, Understood. Now that being said, I do think that there are a lot of good reasons to study tardigrades and other stress tolerant organisms um, for the application for applications to human health. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, for example, we have a we have a project going on with NASA where we'll be culturing tardigrades on the space station um, over multiple generations. Okay. And in that way, we're, we'll be able to essentially look at, you know, what are the stresses and how do tardigrades respond when they first get into space? So okay. when they first get to the space station. But then what responses manifest uh, over multiple generations? So if we look, you know, five generations of tardigrades uh, that have been that have been cultured in space so in microgravity with increased radiation are they dealing with that stress any differently than their ancestors ah. you know that got that got there five generations before and i think that you know we probably won't find something like vitrification is taking place, but you know, they might be uh, making a lot of antioxidants to deal with mm. increased radiation. Um, you know, there may be, you know, changes in their, in their sort of genetic expression of, of different uh, metabolic pathways and stuff like that. And these are all things that we're interested in knowing as we think about, you know, sort of the future of human spaceflight and, and exploration. Sure. Um, is, you know, we probably can't put sort of like a vitrifying system into humans, but certainly, you know, we could develop therapies or countermeasures based around, you know, providing certain antioxidants mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or things like this, um, even through just like dietary means, right? Sure. Just like taking a pill or, or eating certain foods that are rich in antioxidants. So I, I think there is a lot of I don't want to totally sort of cut out the idea of taking what we learn from sh stress tolerant organisms and applying that to humans. Yeah. I just think vitrification, although it's a very appealing idea to think about, it's kind of, it's an interesting thing to think about. I think that one is going to be technically uh, very difficult. Yeah. To well, let's, well, let's somebody in the future work, <laughs> work yeah, on yeah, that yeah. one. <laughs> but, but you, you know, you, you make some interesting points. I, I, it's actually figs into my next question. And I, I, this, this was generally about sort of, you know, we, we touch on obviously uh, aging and longevity on the show quite a right. bit and sort of this principle of, of robustness um, next to sort of fitness or this ability to prevent uh, things from happening to our to our bodies over time. And, uh, you know, this theme of hormesis comes up quite a bit with regard to uh, low level stresses that humans encounter, whether, you know, it's uh, going in a sauna or, uh, you know, going out in the cold and swimming in a lake or, you know, all the things, a little bit of, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger type stuff. Sure. Are there any short term learnings, let's call them from your, from whether it's your tardigrade research or other, uh, you know, plant research, what have you that are applicable today to, to humans on sort of this very, basic sort of robustness mm. level or we still yeah i mean i think the thing the thing about sort of taking what what we learn from from certain organisms and applying it to humans is a lot of, like a lot of times it's maybe not ethical or it just hasn't been done to actually sure. do those tests in humans so you know it's hard to it's hard to say but you know one example that kind of pops to mind that uh isn't necessarily something that my lab has studied, but that that um, in the field of stress tolerance, I think can be can be uh, sort of ported over to humans is this idea of like intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's been seen that you know in a lot of systems, a lot of animal systems, calorie restriction or even like mild starvation right. increases 
lifespan quite dramatically. Um, and I think that, you know, there have obviously intermittent fasting is sort of like a dietary food craze in humans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I'm not aware of research really going into in humans per se, the, the effects on longevity or whatnot. But I, you know, I know there have been studies done looking at mild starvation in humans or calorie restriction in humans and basically comparing the physiology that occurs uh, upon that stress to exercise. Mm -hmm. And in and, and, and that sort of stress actually mimics what you see, you know, with, you know, an hour or so of strenuous exercise, like mm -hmm. 16 to 18 hours of, of intermittent fasting essentially to your physiology looks like you've exercised for an hour. Mm. So um, I think that there may be good lessons to learn, right? Like if, if we sort of modulate our diet, uh, we might actually be healthier and, and live longer. Um, but, but yeah, I think, you know, these sort of things uh, aren't necessarily obviously exported from, a worm, let's say, where you're sure. studying starvation to a sure. human. Sure. Um, but that's kind of that's kind of like my go-to example of no, no, it's, of yeah. how stress can help. It's a great um, example. It's a yeah. great example. And um, you know, I think it, it, it makes for common sense linkages as opposed to you know me going hanging out at a nuclear power plant or something. Right. Yes, please don't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, coming coming back to you now. Um, you know, you, you you mentioned a few mentors uh, at the beginning of the show that sort of sure. uh, guided you on this uh, on this path. Anyone specifically that you would like to give a shout out to here? That you know, if it wasn't for them, you would have uh, decided to go into cardiology or <laughs> do something totally different than this. Uh, that um, any anyone you give a shout out shout out to? Them? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, definitely all, all my, my advisors and mentors in sort of my, my academic um, and professional career have been great. Honestly, I think that my high school biology teacher, uh, uh, Teresa Gerardo Gettens at St. Paul's School in, in Concord, New Hampshire. I mean, she, I, I always like, I always love nature. I can, I can genuinely say that I love nature. I'm not sure that I always liked or loved science. Ah. And I think that she was, she was the first person that really made me appreciate that we can use science, the scientific method, to figure out things about how the universe works and that it can be a lot of fun. So um, although you know, I'm very appreciative of everything that, that other mentors and stuff have done for me, if I had to pick one person to give a shout out to, it would, it would be Dr. G for sure. Outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I really just want to take the time to thank you, um, you know, for, for not just coming on the show, but for everything you're doing, because it clearly is a, a domain of, of biology uh, that is so extremely important for or as we say, moving the human situation forward, uh, whether that is uh, on this planet or elsewhere, uh, and, and really understanding uh, the potential applications, as you, as you highlighted, uh, in, in it just in the preservation of therapeutics and organs and cells one day, uh, the, the, the potential of it is just amazing. And want to really thank you for doing what you do and spending time in it uh, and really sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and you know, for everybody, once again, watching uh, on this channel or going to be listening on the various radio networks, we've been we've been spending time with the amazing Dr. Thomas Boothby, assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Biology, University of Wyoming, uh, studying uh, the biology at the very limits of life. Um, check out his his site and and all his work because it is truly uh, fascinating stuff and and really helping, as we say, move this human story forward. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been a great time. Oh, thanks very much for taking the time to chat with me. I had a great time. Absolutely. Absolutely.